All right, now I'm going to invite Mike Connor up to the stage. He is the course director in music production. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Please help me welcome one of the most cherished members of our Full Sail family, part of our Hall of Fame uh, family, and definitely someone who gives a lot back to this university. Not only was he a graduate in 2001 with the RAA program, sitting in the same seats that you guys have, same experiences, uh, he has taken his hard work and dedication to the top of the recording industry, working with industry giants like Jay-Z and Timberland, and name dot dropping would take an hour to do that. <laughs> but I am very proud to bring to you uh, a gentleman who deserves all the accolades that we can give him, so make sure you clap loud and hard for this gentleman. Demo Castellone, come on in. Yes, sir. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, thank you. How y'all feeling? Yes, it is so great to be back here. I'm telling you, it is amazing that we're in an audio school and the audio sounds the way it does. <laughs> um, it is so great to be back here with all of you. I gotta tell you, this is my favorite time of year. It's my favorite time because it, it gives me a lot of time to reflect on the things that I've done to get to where I'm at. And it's incredibly inspiring to hear some of your stories. You see, you all have a unique story. You have greatness within every one of you. You see, not that long ago, 15 years, I was in that same seat over there, because this was a shopping center. But <laughs> over there, I was in that seat, you know? It wasn't that long ago. And since then, I've had an amazing life. It has been unbelievable. I've gotten to work with countless superstars, gotten to make an incredible living, got a great family, wake up to the most beautiful woman on the planet every day. Yeah, clap it up, clap it up. She's Life is good. <laughs> Life is good. Now, you know, I'm not telling you that to impress you, but I'm trying to tell you this to impress upon you that you can have that. It's not that far off. You see, there's a lot of key components that I went later on and figured out. Well, what is it that made me successful? What is it that makes the other Hall of Famers successful? Why is it that some people come out of here and they win and others don't? I mean, think about that. How many of y'all want to win? Show of hands. Everybody but him. <laughs> oh, no, you got your hand up. It's dark. It's OK. <laughs> yeah, he got two hands up. He's, he's winning. You ready? You ready? You see, it's all about that. It's all about positioning yourself to win. People ask me, well, Demo, what does that mean, position myself to win? See, there's certain things you can do. If you do them a certain way, you're going to get a certain result. But a lot of people get caught up doing the same thing. And they wonder why they keep getting the same result. I mean, that's mind blowing to me, if you really think about it. You go out and you work, right? Y'all in there, y'all getting your grades together. You know what your future looks like. But then you look around, you see other people and they just don't take it as serious as you do. See, that's a, you're positioning yourself to win. That's what it takes. But see, people don't get that. You see, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always gotten. And if you ain't winning, you ain't going to win. But see, luckily for y'all, I already figured it out. And I'm going to share it with y'all today. I, I'm going to share it with y'all today. Yeah. First, I'm going to say what's up to the online streamers. Thank you for tuning in. It's uh, miraculous to have you here with us. And... Uh, Tune in. We're going to have something special for you in a bit. So people say, okay, Demo, I get it. What is the secret ingredient? I say, well, there's a lot of ingredients. But they're like, I need to know the one. What is the one thing 
that can elevate me to greatness. And this without across the board. If you take nothing else from what I tell you and you take this one thing, you off to the races. And that simply is attitude. You see, attitude is everything. Attitude is the little thing that makes a big difference. So Winston Churchill. You see, Zig Ziglar once put it amazing. He said, it is your altitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. Folks, he hit that right on the money. You see, some people just don't see it that way. I mean, how many of y'all have heard this? Uh, by a show of hands, how many in here are audio? Uh, a music program, any music program? Anybody not music, by chance? What programs? Game development, okay. Film? Entertainment business? Show production. Okay, great thing for y'all, this all works. For everything I'm about to tell you, so don't worry about it. You're not being excluded. This goes beyond career. This goes for life. Because it's not about having a great career. It's about having a great life. You see, because success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. It's about, this is the game, folks. I'm giving it to you real. This is real talk. I'm not sugarcoating it at all. There's going to be a lot of interactions. Y'all need to ask the questions because I got the answers. And if not, I'll find it for you. But this is your future. This is where attitude gets built in. You see, how many have heard this kind of nonsense out of somebody's mouth? You might have heard somebody say, well, you know, in the music industry, it's just, it's just falling apart. You know, labels are folding up. Damn, bootlegging is killing the music industry iTunes is messing everything up. There's just no jobs. Think about it. We got to compete against each other. And then everybody else that didn't get a job last month. I mean, how many of you heard that? You see, in, in film, you've probably heard the same thing. You probably say, oh, man, you know, if you're not working in Marvel, you're not going to ever get a job. I mean, it's, it's just all wrapped up. Folks, that nonsense has been here when I was here, it was here before I was here, and it will be here way after you are gone. Some people just choose to look life that way. They just tend to see it that way. I tend to look at it a little differently. You see, when I left here, I literally got, I mean, I hit the jackpot. I literally got the job I wanted one month out. And some people may say that was luck. Some people may say that's coincidence. Whichever way you may look it, I got it. And if I got it, you can get it. You know what I'm saying? But this is the thing. You see, four weeks in, I graduated in August 2001. Four weeks in, I mean, I went to that place. I was in heaven. Six studios, major artists doing double sessions. I mean, you had Celine Dion, you had Gloria Stefan, you had Metallica, I mean, you had your pick of the litter. I went to work, I was like, Jesus, I can't believe this is happening. Damn, this it really paid off, oh my God. I'm off to the races, you know? I'm thinking like, I really struck gold. I mean, think about it, you a month out of here, and all of a sudden you work and you in film, you see Steven Spielberg hanging out. Or you know, you see whoever, your favorite artist pull up, Lenny Kravitz showing up. You're like, wow, I'm winning. <laughs> I'm winning. I'm like, I'm really winning. This is no joke. This stuff works. And then just like that, September 11th happened. I remember watching those planes hit that tower like everybody else, shocked. But I could never expect what was going to happen next. Literally, that place went ghost. Days turned to weeks, turned to months. Nothing. Nothing. Weeks in, months in, people saying, man, we got to move to New York. We got to go to Los Angeles. Ain't nobody ever going to come work here again. I mean, I saw people say, man, I got to go back to school. This music stuff ain't going to work out. They ain't go, nobody's ever, this industry's over. The world has changed. And I mean, I, I thought those things too. But every time I thought about those things, I was like, man, there ain't no way I got this job one month out. This is where I wanted to be at. This is what I wanted to do. There ain't no way it could end like this. So I said, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here, I ain't going to follow everybody else. 
I'm just going to put it in. And then I did. I kept working. You see, those people just chose to look at it that way. I chose to look at it another way. Like, for instance, if I show you this book and I tell you there are no words on this cover, what do y'all say? No, y'all say this. Of course there is. But if I say there are no words on this cover, you see, we're just both looking at opposite sides of the same thing. They just chose to look at it in that perspective. You see, those same people that chose to be like, oh, God, the studios are empty. I was looking around like, oh, God, the studios are empty. Oh, snap, the studios are empty. Oh, snap. Man, I went up to that tech office. I took the whole bundle. I could say this now because Trevor, he, he probably going to watch this, but it's okay now. Um, man, I went to his office. I took his keys. I made copies of all the keys. <laughs> Late at night when everybody was going, I was that dude. I was going in the studio. The first time I went, it was like this. I walked in. I said, oh, wow. I got the whole room to myself. Because, I mean, all I did at that point was just get burgers. I barely got in the room. I'm like, wow. It, it's just like it was in school. Oh, snap. I walk out, leave. The next couple hours later, I come back in. Then I start getting brave. I started putting up booths and mics. And then I got cocky. I was like, oh, yeah, it's nice. I started imagining. I said, you know, hey, yes, yes, Celine, no problem. More <laughs> reverb coming right up. I was chilling. I was chilling, you know. And then I got crazy. I started getting boom boxes, putting boom boxes up, putting the Rolling Stones in there. I'd be like, Mick, I'll get you another beer, no problem. <laughs> Keith, you know, I got your stuff coming. Don't worry. We all good. Man, I did that day in, day out. Same folks was working there I was. They were sitting at the receptionist desk looking like, man, what is this fool doing? Man, I was trying to win. That's what I was doing. They were sitting there playing hooky with the receptionist. I had the studio to myself. I started going room to room, every room I could get in. Then I started getting even crazier. I started bringing in musicians. Imagine you in a coffee shop playing, some young kid come up to you, you know, I'm an engineer, I can, I can record you at my studio. They show up at the hit factory. <laughs> it's blowing their mind. But that's what I'm saying. See, it was an attitude. Those same folks, let me tell you something, those same folks were more talented, they were more gifted, and they had a hell of a lot more attributes than I did. You know where they lost? They lost sight of the ball. And that's what happens. People lose sight of it. I speak to a bunch of y'all. I see it. Most of y'all say, you know what, Demo, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a production company, and then I'm going to be an engineer, and then I'm going to make documentaries, and then I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm like, that's, that's awesome that you want to do all that. But what are you going to do first? What is it that drives you? You see, you got to keep your eye on the ball, folks. You can all win. There's enough there for everybody. People been saying for years, man, there ain't no work. Man, I ain't never had no problem getting no work. I'm not the only person. It's just their way they look at it. Man, I'm telling you, y'all can win. I wouldn't come back here and say this for y'all to be like, you're a liar. I'm like, no, I'm not. If you do what I'm telling you, you're going to win. How many of you got goals written down? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have it written down now? Yes. How many of you have it with you? We got one, two, three, four, five. If you don't have it with you, you ain't serious about it. How are you going to write down your goal and leave it on the table? Man, that goal got to be with you 24-7. You see, I'm up here right now. Every time I touch my, my, my you see my hand touching this, I'm there. I'm doing exactly what I am I'm supposed to be doing. The name of the game is focus, folks. And I want you to write this down and not forget it. Focus is a single, a single very easy acronym. Follow one course until successful. That's all you need to do. Figure out what you want to do and then go do it. Now, I know some of y'all saying, well, Demo, that's easy for you to say. You're a unique individual. And I would say, yeah. But y'all are unique too. But maybe you are the anomaly. I get that a lot. Maybe you're just the oddball out of all of us. You know, the funny thing is, six months after I was at the Hit Factory, 
another graduate showed up there. And this graduate did something unbelievable at the time. I couldn't even fathom how this was done. It blew my mind for months. This grad happened to secure a job when they weren't hiring. They were firing people because they didn't want to pay anybody because there was no, nothing going on. Not only did this grad secure a job interview, she secured the job when they wasn't hiring. Now, some of y'all may know this, some of y'all didn't, but it was Marcella Reich, a Hall of Famer. Give her a clap. Yes. Give her a clap. I want you to think about this, this Hall of Fame. Just get it in perspective. There's been over 50,000 plus graduates. This Friday, there will officially be 42 of us in the Hall of Fame. Anybody got any idea what the percentage is of that? You say 10? No, less than 1,000. Less than 1,000. Less than 1,000. It's actually 0.084. You're talking about 1% of the 1%. The information of how to do it is here. These next three days, while they're here, you stalk every one of them, except me, because I'm here. <laughs> but every one of them, y'all can stop me. That's cool. I'll give you an info. But I'm saying every one of them has it. In whatever field you want, they got it. You just got to go ask. Because that's the first principle is to go after it. Because if you don't go after it, you're not going to get it. It's all good if you think you can figure it out. I mean, listen, it took me seven years to accomplish what I set out to do. I gave myself ten. I was fortunate enough to do it in seven. There's no reason why y'all can't do it in half that time. I'm telling you, it can be done. But you, it all lies within y'all. Is this getting, y'all getting me? Y'all get, staying with me? Because y'all want great things, right? I mean, it's nice to be able to fly all around the world. I mean, from here on, I travel west until I finally get back home a month from now. That's awesome. Yes, that's, that's, that's good. You like, you like that. <laughs> He's going that way. Well, yeah, that's where I'm going. I mean, this is nice. It's nice to be able to do the things you want. I'm sure you got ambitions. I'm sure you got places you want to go. I'm sure you got things you want to do. I mean, it can be done. How many of y'all want to do that? Do great. Shake somebody's hand on your left and right and say, that's in my future. Yes. That's right. It sure is in your future. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yo, what are some concerns that y'all have right now? How many of y'all graduate within the next three to six months? Let me just get a gauge. Okay, cool. So a lot of y'all just about to jump in it. What are some concerns you have right now? Go ahead, young. Microphone for this young lady, please. Thank you. Stand and give us your name. Hi, I'm Dia. Dia. Uh, and I... I'm an entertainer, I'm a songwriter, I'm an enthusiast at life. Yes. I like to have fun and I like to inspire people besides okay. myself and relate to people with my writing. Um, I am super concerned about how to break into the songwriting industry because it's really weird because I feel like when you want to be an engineer like you, you go to a studio and become an intern and mm -hmm. do all that. But when you want to be a songwriter and write for Katy Perry, and then hopefully beyond that, have my own career as an entertainer, mm -hmm. um, mixing Chelsea Handler, Demi Lovato, all that together, mm -hmm. my own personal thing. Uh, it's a little weird to figure out. I know exactly where I want to go, but I don't know how to start, and that's terrifying to me. Okay. So what fear. specifically terrifies Keep the mic. What specifically terrifies you about that? Um, that... I've always known where I want to go, and I still know where I want to go, but I don't know the immediate step. And it's kind of scary that I've, it's a new feeling. Not scary, new feeling. New. I, That's excited. quite different. Because I'm excited, and I'm like, you I'm are. so ready to take on the world, and I have three years, and I'm going to have a Grammy. It's mm -hmm. going to be awesome. I'm going to be super successful. But it's like the first year, I don't know what I'm doing. But once I get that first job, I'm like, yeah, I got this. Ready. You got I just it. Don't know how I'm getting the first. She's job. gonna get it. Yeah, y'all. You guys sense this. She's gonna get it. 
She's winning. She's winning. But it's like, I don't know where I'm getting my first job, and that's scary to me. I get it. You see, you're cursed with ambition. That's a curse. <laughs> it's a get better curse. The great thing about this is this. You've already been successful. The thing is, is that you've been successful doing things you already know how to do. See, what you're doing now is you set something that stretches you. That's the part that's terrifying and also exciting at the same time. That's a good feeling. Embrace it. Listen, all you need to do is keep the eye on the ball. You constantly focus on it. You don't keep doing the same thing. Keep researching. Keep finding different means. Don't ever take no for an answer. Most people are going to say no to you about seven times before you get a yes. That's an average. Learn that right now. You might want to write that down. You're going to get a lot of no's. There's, it's not because of you. It just means they're not ready for what the greatness is you're going to give them. So we got to prepare them a little bit. You know what I'm saying? With her case, she's just stretching. She's finally stretching. She's been doing this her whole life. She's going sideways because she knows what she's doing. You're finally on track. Listen, fear is a fantastic thing. But this is the thing about fear. Write this acronym down. It's a fantasized event that appears real. The reality is it's not real. It hasn't happened yet. Somebody's scared of dying in an airplane. The plane did not crash. You are not dead. It's not real. You're creating this. You're creating this. There is nothing wrong with failure. You want to embrace failure. Sit down. You want to embrace failure. This is good. Failure is a good thing. Listen, I have failed epically. I still do. I mean, I fail really, on the average, about three times a week. <laughs> it's probably my average right now, but it's a good thing. Because, see, you don't learn from success. You think you do, but you really learn from failure. I mean, trust me, the first time you're on a job and you do something wrong and you get snapped at by somebody, you ain't going to make that mistake again. <laughs> so it's okay. Rejection is not a bad thing. It does not mean nothing. It doesn't mean because you face rejection that you say, yo, this is it. My dream is not possible because somebody doesn't believe in me. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. My entire life, and some of these people are watching this streaming right now, and I'm going to blast them right now because I can do that. I got the mic now. A lot of them were the same ones telling me I couldn't do it, that it wasn't possible, that I was too ambitious, that the things that I wanted to do, it just wasn't cap they weren't capable of seeing that. They weren't capable of seeing me working with Madonna, sitting there with Jay-Z, working with Timbaland. They couldn't see that. They couldn't see me performing the sold-out stadiums, arenas. They was like, yo, what are you, crazy? Who thinks these things? I do. So do y'all. Let me tell you something. They might think it's impossible, but the reality is that it's extremely possible. But it all goes down to your attitude. You see, if you fixate on the idea that the world is coming down on you, guess what? The world is going to come down on you. It's just not the reality of it. It's a perception thing. Because, see, everything has good and bad things to it. My career has had a lot of great things. But I'm sure if you ask people, there's been a lot of bad things, too. It's just what it is. Positive and negative just go with each other. But you don't have to accept the reality of somebody else's condition. That doesn't make it your circumstance. It doesn't mean you're not destined to do what you need to do. You just need to go do it. Folks, you're going to fail. I'm, I'm going to let the cat out the bag. You're going to mess up. So it's going to be some times that it's going to be bad, really bad. You're going to hit a brick wall, and you are going to question everything you've ever done. You're going to question whether this was even worth it. You're going to be like, why was I thinking I should have just stayed in mediocrity because it's so comfortable. That's what's happening with her. She's breaking into her greatness. And she knows because she's excited. Same time, she's terrified. That's an amazing place to be in. Embrace that because that's where the creativity comes out. When you have to sit there and you're like, yo, I am not playing. I don't care what I got to do, but I'm going to do it. People ask me all the time, well, yo, how'd you get that job at the hip factory? And I like to say I just made myself the only logical choice. <laughs> but the reality is I did position myself as the only choice at that time. And for instance, 
I was going around campus, and they would always have like the same thing they were doing now, but they, they have like these little festivals and stuff going on. And I remember there was a gentleman by the name of Doc Wiley. He's a Pro Tools, he worked in Pro Tools, like one of the face of Pro Tools engineers, and he worked at a studio in Miami. So I said, damn, I'm gonna get with this dude, because he's down there, so at least I can get in. And the entire day, I was literally earshot from him. So I was here, and he was there, and I was pretending I was doing stuff, but I was just honed in on him. I knew everything he was, I mean, I, I was kind of prying at some personal shit, but <laughs> enough that. But I was listening, and then within the course of 45 minutes, he said something, and the light went off. He said, you know, DigiDesign, for y'all that don't know that I used to be Avid, or Avid used to be DigiDesign, he said, DigiDesign's coming out with a Pro Tools certification course. How ridiculous is that? They're going to start certifying Pro Tools guys. He was making a big joke of it, and the light went off. I said, I want that. Where do I get that? He kept talking, and I was just waiting. He didn't say nothing. I ran. I lived down by Goldenrod, so I ran right to my house. Got on the phone, started calling DigiDesign. They were like, how did this guy found, find out about this? Man, they were having a Pro Tools certification course one block from the hip factory. Yeah, I didn't even have the money, but I signed up. I said, I'll, fi I'll find it, sure. Whatever I got to do, I'll sell a kidney or something. I'm getting the certification. <laughs> it's going down. I know I need this in my life. So, you know, I went in for that job interview. And this is some real stuff I'm about to tell you. I went into that job interview, and I was looking fresh. I was feeling good. I went there the night before, and I kind of did reconnaissance and shit. I was, uh, binoculars, looking at the parking lot signs, seeing who was working and all that. I did my due diligence, and I did a lot of research. I'm the studio manager. I mean, I did research on the place. I didn't go in there and leave anything to chance. And I went in. I remember I walked in, man. I walked in with that strut. You know, I walked in like did my strut. And I opened the door and right sitting on the couch, the interview before me is my homegirl that my, in my study group. Yo, we looked at it like deers in headlights. And I just heard in, in my head, all I could hear was like, wow, shit just got real. Like, it just got, we are, comp I was, we was just kicking it, like, and I'm, the fangs come out, like, I'm ready, you know? And then to make matters worse, she goes upstairs for the interview. I get, I start filling out the form. I sit down. She don't even last 30 seconds. So now I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> like, damn, she didn't even get 30 seconds. I'm like, I didn't even finish writing my name. Man, I went up there. I was shook. And then I walk into this interview. I am not exaggerating. It's like a cartoon. Y'all ever seen the Daily Planet when um, yeah. the dude was spied with Peter Parker? You remember when on them desks how he had that big ass stack of resumes? Man, it was one of those. And I was so in all that because I only seen that in the cartoons. I sat down and I was fixated on it. And Trevor's looking at me. He's just like, a lot of resumes. I was like, yeah. I was like, what's that from like the last six months? He's like, that's from last week. I was like, oh, so I'm just, I'm just killing myself here. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm trying to catch my bearings, as you can imagine. I'm trying to get it together, but I'm like, I'm reeling. And it goes on for like 10, more about five, 10 minutes in. And I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good about it, but I just don't know. I just don't really know if I'm gauging it. I, I'm saying, okay, I, I feel like I'm making an impression, but is it enough? And then the words came out of his mouth that I remember changed everything. He says, so from Pro Tools, what do you rank yourself from 1 to 10? I said, well, I'm a 7 right now, but in two weeks, I'll be a 12. He looked at me. He said, well, are you some kind of smart ass? What do you mean you're going to be a 12 in two weeks? I said, no, no, no. Listen, I'm taking this Pro Tools certification course. Did you? And all of a sudden, his head did this tilt. And you can tell he had no idea what I was talking about. But he was, I, I had him. He, I had his attention. See, I did something that no one else had done. And sure enough, two weeks later, he called me. He said, when are you taking your certification course? I said, next week. He said, come the week after. <laughs> I literally, this is some stupid shit I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to keep it real because I said when I was going to do this, I was going to keep it real. So listen to this mess. I'm sitting I'm in front of my mama's house. She lives in a busy street. And my homeboy, I ain't seen from school. I ain't seen him in like five or six years. Pulls up, and I'm like I'm kicking it, and I get the call. Trevor talks. I'm like, oh, my God. My legs get weak. And I lay out on the street. And my friend goes to me, man, what the hell are you doing? I said, man, I just got my dream job. He said, ain't you trying to kill yourself? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you doing? I'm like, oh, man, my life's done changed forever. <sighs> Weak. Weak. 
you know, there's a lot to this. People think it's easy. You know, y'all sit here and y'all can see all the accolades and all the things I've, I've done. And y'all can sit there and be like, man, that's amazing. But there's a lot of stuff that y'all did not see. There was a lot of times I walked into that building and I went to do something and it was like, oh, don't let him do it. He don't know what he's doing. He's just a youngin. Like when I came out, it wasn't really that many young engineers like that. There was some, but we were so spread out, it wasn't, it wasn't often you would see one. So I would always come in and they'd be like, oh, no, don't let this, this kid on. He was just straight out of school. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> like, man, countless, countless times they told me, yo, man, no, nah, this ain't for you. No, nah, you can't do this. Like, oh, you'll never do that. Like, what, are you kidding? You producer? Like, what, are you kidding me? Like, you're an urban kid. You stick to urban music. Yo, know, man, constantly, man. Like, going back to my hood and, like, seeing people and they're like, oh, you still getting burgers? You paid all that money for that school and you still getting people's lunch and shit? Like, man, it's a tough pill to swallow. Tough pill to swallow when you're going home and, you know, you know your family and stuff looking at you like, man, this dude is an idiot. And you're like, no, I got this dream. I'm going to be this great thing. And he's saying it's difficult. It's difficult to swallow. Difficult, difficult when you know you're doing something great and people are sitting there telling you, man, you are terrible. All them records that I was doing and mixing and these people looking at me like, man, this is garbage. This is terrible. Oh, man, don't ever hire this dude. Man, constantly, constantly running into that wall. It just never ended. It felt like at times I was getting, I was drowning in this mess. I was sitting there going like, man, is this really going to be worth it? Like I just constantly am getting bombarded by all this negativity. And there were times, I tell you, I want to throw in the towel. There were times I was like, man, I'm, forget this mess. And I don't know if it was pride or ego, but some would come out and be like, man, we're going to do it. Like it just, we've gone too far already. Like how are we going to leave this on the table? We're just going to leave it. That's it. You can pack up and do it again and keep doing it. Questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Let him go first. Oh. Stand up, buddy. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Jeffrey Williams from Youngstown, Ohio, and um, I'm doing film production. I'm getting my master's in film production. But... Uh, my question would be, as far as um, friends, like, what, what would be your advice on the choice of friends? Because I see you have a real zealous attitude towards your goals. Um, like, how did you surround yourself with people that fed that? Man, you're like a mind reader, because that's exactly where I was going next. Okay, cool. Cause this, I, this, I'm going to start giving you things that you can incorporate right now. That's crucial. One I already told you, get your attitude right. Focus on your goal. So write that down and focus on it. Listen, if you don't got one, I don't care. Write one down. No matter what it is, just write something down and focus on it. The next thing I want you all to do, especially you online, is look at the people you surround yourself with. This is crucial to your success, what I'm about to tell you. Look at the people around you. When I was here, I was constantly surrounded by great people. But when I left here, I was in a different environment. And I was surrounded by the same people I grew up with. The same people that was like, man, I'm from Miami. Like, yo, let's go down to the beach, man. Let's go to the club. Like, yo, this is going to be popping. Y'all want to go? Come on. Come on. Why are you going to go to the studio? Like, let's go later. Like, constantly trying to drag me out of that. Surround yourself with people that if you're trying to make a movie or sitting there going, yo, I found a great location that might be fresh for you, or someone that's constantly telling you, yo, what are you doing today to work on what you're doing? See, if you surround yourself with dummies, you're going to be a dummy. But if you surround yourself with genius, man, it is impossible to come in contact with genius and greatness and not be affected by it. It's impossible. It can't happen. You can try, but it's going to rub off on you. Look at your circle of peers. And now this is going to be tough because some of your circle of peers are probably relatives and people you've known for a long time. If you keep doing the same thing you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always gotten. Because what happens is the moment you start getting ahead, they're going to start putting the clamp on you. Because this is what happens. 
people start seeing you want, they, they, like if you ask these people, they say, man, I, lo I love Demo. I want him to do great things. But this is what happens. When you start going after your goal and you're going for greatness, you're going to break the bank. These people clamp down. And the reason why is because they see in you what they don't have the courage inside of them to do. They look at you and say, man, I'm in mediocrity. He's going for greatness. And they try everything in their power to hold you back. And it's not where it's at. See, some people take the approach of, man, I just want to help the people I'm with. I want to elevate my game to do that. You know, you can't babysit people to success. You want to help people? Become successful and then show them through your actions how you did it. You can help your entire hood. Man, when I first started going back to my hood, everybody was messing up. But I'm telling you, as soon as I started being in the tabloids, started doing all the other mess I was doing, started getting out there and people started knowing what I'm doing, it changed the whole dynamic in my hood. It was now people that was like, they was happy working at the bank. Now they're coming back, yo, man, you know, I left the bank. Well, what you doing now? Man, I'm working regional now. Yeah, I got, I'm making more money now. I'm doing this. Yo, I just got that car I always said I wanted to get. Yo, I'm finally caught up in my child support. I'm like, damn, about damn time. <laughs> <laughs> Scrub. <laughs> like, but real talk, it elevates them. They see that and they're like, man, I got to step my game up. Because they see that if you can do it, they know, they know like, damn, you can do it, I can do it. Shit, it's the truth. That's the reality of it. Anybody else? Question? Yeah, you got jokes. I'm dying to laugh too. Go ahead. Hog in the mic. I've got two questions. Back okay. to the friends question. How do you balance being young and having fun because, you know, I am 20 and do want to experience a little bit of fun and really working and honing in on your craft and being able to do both. Okay, what do you think question. is fun? Um, I like to, I mean, like, personally, I love yeah. to have parties because I love to entertain okay. people okay. in every sense of the manner. So, like, I love to throw parties. Okay. But, like... Where do you throw your parties at now? My apartment. Your apartment? Yeah. It's now, August. don't you think it'd be nice to throw parties on your own island? Okay, I completely agree with that, and I'm going to. In Aruba? Oh, once again, as I said, I'm going to, but it's like, I like doing a little bit, of, you know. Listen, you, like, can, do you, you say can do whatever you like. Personally, this is what I would advise you to do. Okay, that's... Because you think right now that what you're doing, man, I, my sister-in-law... She would tell this shit to me all the time, and I never would listen to her. She's like, you think you're doing it big now, going down to the beach? That ain't nothing. You'll see. When you become successful, you really get that. Man, I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. I do it big all the time, baby. I club knocking it out. Man, she hit that junk right on the money. Because for those seven years, I was focused. And then when I finally started, I was like, man, I'm, I'm inviting my friends. We're going to Italy. Real. You know, I'm like... Doing, it, doing real things. Like, I'm not saying you got to be a monk. But I'm saying if you become a monk, you're going to reach enlightenment faster. So <laughs> it's your, your call. Like, how do you want to do it? Real, I mean, real talk. Real talk. It's not, it's like, listen, there is no right way or wrong way. It just is. There is no right or wrong. It just is the way it is. You can do that. People do it all the time and become successful. I personally am in the approach that if you focus on one thing and you see it all the way through, like, it, you know what it is? I haven't worked in a year and a half. Like, most people would say that and be scared. I'm making more money talking here for free to y'all than most people do at their job. Think about that. That's not by coincidence. That's a lot of work that built to that. I mean, I'm going to be in Fiji. Most people are going to be in an office. <laughs> like, that's a party. It's nice there. You would like it. You would like it. I'm just saying, get to, get, for me, I say go for it. But if you're going to do anything, listen, you do anything, just do it in moderation. It's cool. If you want to go out, you want to blow some steam, I'm not against that. M what I'm against is every weekend saying this is what you got to do. And then saying, why am I not getting to where I'm supposed to get to? Why is, it, why is life treating me this way? You know, like, that's not where it's at. 
You got another one? Oh, you just gonna, this is gonna be one-on-one. I got one, on one. I got one more. Okay. How do you balance uh, confidence and cockiness? That's a brilliant question. That's a brilliant question. Now, y'all can see there's a certain level of arrogance that comes from me. It just comes. This is built into it. I know. I get it. I get this shit a lot. I'm going to tell you right now, this will not help you. I had to learn this shit the hard way, and it cost me a lot of jobs. It's all good to have confidence in yourself. No, I mean, that's a great thing to have. But confidence in yourself is seeing a challenge and saying, you know what? I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to do it. That's confidence. Arrogance is a whole other ball game. You start alienating people with that. And that was one of the reasons I didn't get a lot of those gigs. And that's the reason why I had a lot of those haters going, yo, you ain't man, forget this kid. Who the fuck do you think he is? Think he's somebody? He nobody. Go get my burger, punk. Like, that's how they would talk to me, man. <laughs> and it, I deserved it because I really thought I was, I didn't realize it, but I was giving that off because I was so hungry. I learned later on, you just add being humble to it. You can, be, you can have a level of arrogance and self-confidence, but just be humble for it. You know what I'm saying? And this is something you guys can incorporate right now. If, if you're one, there's a couple of y'all in here I can spot you. I just got that extra swag going. Like, if you're somebody that lets that off, it's easy. Just constantly ask for feedback. So when you're working on a project, I do this all the time. I do it to the point that it annoys people. Like, I do this to Madonna every night. So, I know the session went well, and this went really great. And this one, was, so what can we fix? She's like, fool, if I didn't think it was good, you'd be gone. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but I still need feedback. Can you tell me? And I, I'll get something. She'll be like, well, I, I liked it when we did this. Can we do more of that? And then I add it in. But constantly adding, getting feedback. You know, everybody I work with, I'll just constantly say, listen, anything that you feel we can improve for next time. See, I'm prepping them for next time. Next time we work together, you cut me a check, what can I do for you to make it better? <laughs> see, there's arrogance in there, but it, see how it like dimmed down? That's all. You just humble yourself, man. Humble. You don't, arrogance will not play to your favor. It won't. I haven't seen anybody that has it that's really winning because of it. Right, right here and then right here? Sure, okay. Here and then there. Sorry, man. He, he has the mic. I'm just my boss here. Uh, my name's Isaiah. I Isaiah. take music business. Um, okay. What was the hardest thing you went through while you were at, uh, here as Full Sail? The hardest thing I went through when I was here? I would say probably leaving it was the hardest thing for me because I just, I, man, my environment was toxic. And this place was like heaven to me, man. It was like... I was, I was constantly in every, I mean, Tim will tell you, I was everywhere. <laughs> I was everywhere and anywhere. Anything I could get into, I was getting into it. Like, they'd be shooting films, and I'd be in there playing extra. <laughs> like, trying to act. I did acting. I didn't know how to act. They fired me on the spot. Like, man, you were bad. Like, this is like the worst audition I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, man, I thought I was pretty good. They're like, you were terrible. <laughs> but I just did all that. So the hardest thing for me was definitely leaving, but also the transition. Like, what are a lot of y'all feeling now? Like, what? there's a certain level of certainty you get here, which is very comforting. And it's scary to think what happens after here. It doesn't have to be that way. Because just like when you first came here, there was a level of uncertainty. You didn't really know what to expect. Yeah, you got the tour. You bought into it and said, okay, I could, I could have a great life doing this. I could, I could imagine myself working on film sets making the next big-ass game, the next Call of Duty or whatever. Like, you get that, but there's still uncertainty until you got here. And then you all got in rhythm, figured out how the system works for you, and made it work. You're going to get that when you leave here. There'll be uncertainty. But don't, don't freak out about it. Let's say, okay, this is just my transition. This is just what's going to happen. My greatness is right there. Man, victory is always this close. Right when the situation gets the hardest, that's when you know you're about to have a breakthrough. I mean, you're that close. That my, all my gigs have come that way. I was telling somebody the story, and some of you might have heard this earlier. They asked me how to make the transition from recording to mixing. And I was like, man, um, I just kept mixing. Then I started thinking about it. I was like, man, you know what? I'm going to put this story on blast too because... I'm still a little bit salty about it. But 
you know, it was when we were doing Nelly's Loose album. Like, all those mixes that you hear were all my rough mixes. Like, I started recording it, so I was mixing it, and I was going. And mind you, I had six, seven months to work on that record. So there was no way anybody was going to do something better than what I was doing. But it didn't work that way. Man, we in a, they, they have a meeting to play this for the label. It was Polly Anthony and Tom Panunzio. Polly was the president of Geffen, and Tom was like a VP of the A&R on it. And the studio door is like right here. The lounge is here. Timbaland and Polly and Tom are in here. The door is broken. It doesn't close. You can practically hear the conversation. There's no point of having a door. Everybody knows this, including Tim, because we work in this room all the time. I'm sitting right here, and I hear Tom say, here in the mix, I'm like, damn, that should sound good. I hear Tom say, man, these mixes sound amazing. Do we have these mixes? Like, can we get these mixes? And I'm sitting there going, yeah, boy, I'm about to get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm about to get it. And then, just like that, I hear Timbaland say, oh, no, demo mixer. You don't know how to mix. This, I got to get Jimmy to mix it. And I'm sitting here shocked. I'm like, this dude, just, I, I swear to God, I wanted to go and like punch him in the face, but I was like, this ain't going to help my cause. I'm so mad. I'm sitting there like, I don't believe this dude. He just said like, man, he didn't stop there. He went for like five minutes. I had to hear this mess for five minutes. Oh, no, Demo, he just had a school. No, he's just a recording engineer. You don't know how to mix. What's wrong with y'all? This is the number one album. We need da 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 Man, just, I mean, my ego got crushed that day. I mean, crushed. I thought I was on it. I thought I was about to have it. But no. See, at that point, I could have looked at it. My attitude could have changed. I could have been like, you know what? Forget Timbaland. Forget this stuff. I'll go work with somebody else. And that would have been it. But I sat there and I looked at it realistically like, well, I'm stuck here, but it's not a bad place to be stuck at. So I just looked, changed my attitude around him. I said, well, you know what? He's a genius. He's a bit of an asshole right now, but he's a genius. <laughs> I saw how cute that was. It was what it was. But let me tell you what happens. You see, this goes into the next thing I want to talk about, is you got to get into the habit of over-delivering. Don't get comfortable with just hitting the norm. You got to over-deliver. You got to do way more than you're ex what's expected of you. Because great people do that. They just have a natural way of doing it. See, I was always over-delivering. It just was built into how I work. I was like that here. I've been like that most of my life. I just, I don't know when to stop. I just keep going. And that was the case here because they went and got Jimmy to mix that record. Man, that junk did not work. Mind you, he had, he could have two months to mix it. I had six. I'm not even going to come close to what I'm doing. And then some genius decided that they wanted to get Dave Fensato to mix. How many of y'all know Dave Fensato? Yeah, Dave's a legend. Now I got shook because Jimmy I knew, Dave I didn't know. So I was like, oh, snap. Damn, I don't know if I'm going to pull this off. Dave had the Mary record out at the time. He had all these other pussycat dolls and all this other stuff. So I was like, man, I'm going against a G now. I mean, Jimmy, is, he's an OG too, but I was like, it was different because I knew Jimmy. I didn't know Dave. Man, and they, we went to L.A., and he mixed promiscuous. And, man, at the end of the day, they ended up picking my mixes. It just sounded better. Compared to Dave had one day to mix it, like, again, six months. That moment changed the whole trajectory of my life. Because from 2005 to 2007, I was the hottest mixer on the planet. I was creme of the creme. Folks, when I tell you, it's nice to be up top. <laughs> yes, it's nice to be up top. It's nice to be numero uno. Like, that's where you want to get to. Because when you get there, oh, problems just disappear. Like, man, I need a new car. Hmm, they want me to mix that record. How much is that car? This is how much I need the record. <laughs> you know, you could do stuff like that. That's nice. See, I like that, huh? Yeah, yeah, I like that. I can see that. But that's it. It was just taking the opportunity, you know, and attitude, switching it around and over-delivering gave me that. So get into the habit of doing that now. See, these are habits. You got to build this in. Winning, the formula of winning has to be built in. It doesn't just work where you just do what you want and I'm going to do this one day and I'm not do it the other day. No, these are habits you built into what you do. You start with your attitude. You figure out your goal. You focus on that goal. Surround yourself with people that are going to help you push towards that goal. And then over deliver. When the wall hits, you back up, say, damn, that was a hard hit. 
What did I learn from this? This is where people mess up. They have failures and they just keep running. You just stop. Say, okay, how did I even get in this position? Okay, I shouldn't have trusted this person. I should have done this. I should have done that. And then you make the adjustments and you keep moving. And then you could, it gets to a point now, I mean, I see those things coming from a mile away. It's like the matrix in my life. I'm just like, stop. <laughs> Gone. It's nice. More questions? Oh, that's right. Hey, you forgot about it, man. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's all good. Then he gave you a broken mic. Right here. No, no, oh. get him, see if the mic's Hello? Can hear him. Hello, I'm on? All right. Okay. How you doing, Demo? Um, Good. Name is Avion. Avion. Hey, um, you. you know, MP Music Production. Great. Shout out to y'all, you know, whoever. All right. Yeah, yeah. Give MP? it up, give it up. Right. Okay. Um, hey. I, I had a question about, uh, earlier on, you were, you were saying that being in New York, you know, 9-11 uh, happened and it was, you know, studio. I was in Miami. I was in Miami. Oh, you were in, I, okay. I was in Miami, so I wasn't in New York. But the studio was empty, correct? Because yes. of what was going on. Um. I plan on going back home to New York and, you know, it's just recently been brought up to my attention that, you know, it's not really the place to be anymore in terms of actually looking for work in the, uh, in the music industry. So uh, what would be your advice for someone who wants to say, you know, F that, I'm, I'm going to do it anyways and, and kind of rise from the ashes of that? Which so is what you're going to do. Right. You're just asking me this just to see if everybody else is going to agree with you. Hey, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> well, let's go. <laughs> What is it you want? Uh, I want to be a producer, songwriter. Um, I also sing, but my, my heart is in producing and, and creating music. So we'll see. You know, I'm just focused on producing right now, which okay. is what you're saying. See, I'm already taking notes. I know. You know, I'm, you I'm focusing on producing first. Okay. Everything else will come after. Yes. So that's my main goal right now is to get into, the, uh, into production. Mm. So I'm curious, where is it that things are popping off now? Well, I'm hearing in L.A. and Atlanta right now. That's what I'm hearing. Well, for what kind of music? Oh, uh, that's, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know that answer. Yeah. <laughs> See, the people you're talking to, they just got one way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Man, there's work everywhere. I mean, Alabama Shakes. That's what the name is, right? Alabama yep, Shakes? Alab Alab They're from Athens, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Have y'all looked up Athens, Alabama? Yes. There's nothing there. <laughs> They're making it work. Like, see, you don't, it's not the environment. It's the same thing when I went to, when I was at Miami in the Hit Factory, that place was not where it was at. It didn't matter to me. I wasn't focused on where things change. Things change all the time. Industries are constantly evolving. People are evolving. Music is evolving. It's an evolution. Things don't stay one way or another. You got to position yourself for what's best for what you want to do. Nobody else knows what's best for you but you. If New York is where you want to be at, and you're like, yo, this is where I want to be at because this works for what I want to do, go. I could have went to New York. I could have went to L.A. But for me, for what I wanted to do, the Hit Factory just made perfect sense. It just made sense. I had family there. I didn't have to worry about certain costs, certain expenses. I just said, this is a good, I felt right. You got to trust your intuition. Listen, your intuition speaks to you all the time. Most people say, you know, prayers when you're speaking to God. Well, your intuition is when the creator is speaking back at you. So if you get a feeling, like you ever been around somebody and you're just like, man, there's something wrong about this person. And you get away? Yeah, that's your intuition. It's telling you, get away from this joker. This is, this is no good. Or you walk into a place and you're like, damn, I got to get out of here. That's your intuition. Trust your instincts. If your instincts are telling you one thing, go with them. Folks, there is, I want to keep telling you, there is no right or wrong way to do this. The wrong way is just the other way that's not working. So you can change it. You can go any way you want. Questions? I saw somebody's hand over here. That's right. Here. Hello. Oh. Hey, Demo. My name's Nate. I'm in uh, Recording Arts. Okay. Uh, I have a question based on the choices you'll have, like, moving on. Like, I'm going to be graduating, I believe, September of this year, okay. and uh, I have a connect in Boston that is like 45 minutes away from my house, but I also want to probably move out to LA. My question is, how do you decipher between what you think is the best decision and what might be too big for what your I position get is at the time? 
I get you. That's a great question. Everybody's circumstance is different, so you have to take what I'm going to tell you and think about your circumstance, whether this works. One of the key reasons why I went to Miami and not New York, because there was a hit factory there, was because I was at home. I knew I could afford it. I could stay with my mother for a while until I got it together. So that was a big part of the actual piece to it. So you have to ask yourself, what is the long-term goal that you're trying to do? If it is, I want to move to L.A. and I want to work in L.A., that's, that's, that's where I want to be at. I love California. I want to get out of the East Coast. Cool. So you look at, realistically, you look at your, what you have now. Okay, what do I have now? Do I know people out there? Find the most creative ways to see if that works, if that's an option. See, most people don't do that. They just say, well, I'll do that one day. I'm just going to stay in Boston. No, explore the options. Look into it. Figure out how much it's going to cost you. What it's going to be like, how far, whether you need a car, you're going to need a car. So how much fuel is going to cost you? Like actually sit there and say, what would it cost me to go to Los Angeles? And then once you have the numbers down, you sit there and say, well, it's going to cost me $2,500 a month. You figure out where you want to work at. Apply for jobs there. See if it balances out. At the same time, you could be doing that and set up your stuff in Boston. Don't, this is the thing. You can cross map this thing. I mean, you can hit everything. I, I chose specifically one route, but you can do this all across the board as long as you're aiming at the same place. So build them both. Set them both up. But do the numbers. This is key. Budgeting is key. Say it with me. Budgeting is key. Budgeting is key. Yes. Figure out what it costs you to live. You might think, man, it costs a lot of money. It might not cost you that much money. And you can find ways to supplement those costs. Like maybe your folks, you get some help from your folks. If that's not an option, that's all good. You can do a part-time. There's ways to do it. Just pretend there are no limits. And keep going until you hit one. And then make the adjustments and keep going. But work on both. If you want to go L.A., work it out. Just say, okay, if this was my only option, how would I make this work? And then work backwards. This gentleman right here, and then... We have a social media question. Is it okay if we go ahead and take it? Well, <laughs> what social media specifically? On the Full Sail channel. Well, I guess that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Which... <laughs> she took me serious, too. <coughs> uh, Josh has a question. He's in the audio production degree program. Josh? He says, I'm ready to intern at a studio after graduation but is it frowned upon if you can't commit as much time to studio as others because of time committed to providing financially for your family? That's a good question. Where's Josh at, right here? Give me Josh. So, Josh, a couple things. <laughs> Thank you for coming in live and direct. I got love the world we live in today. I'm talking, he, he don't even, I don't even know where he's at. He's probably like sitting there in his drawers, just sitting there like, I'm talking to the devil. <laughs> it's a pizza. This is just killer, right? <laughs> Shout out to y'all right now. Um, Josh, this is the thing. Some employers are probably not going to like the idea that they can get you. It's, it's a little bit of a disadvantage. However, we all got commitments that we got to go through. And yes, some people have children and families they have to support. You need to do what's best for you and best for your family. You know what I'm saying? When I mean your family, I mean like if you have kids and you have people that are dependent on you on their survival is dependent on you. You got to make the best decisions for you. However, that doesn't mean that you're limited in what you're doing. See, it all works with communication. You just communicate these things. You never know, Josh, if you start going after the things you want, you might get a job that could cover all your finances. See, there's internships that are paid. Mind you, they don't pay a lot, but it's just temporary. These things are all temporary, and sometimes you've got to make sacrifices in the beginning for long-term gain. So my best advice to you is just really map down what is it that you want. Where do you want it, and how do you want to get there? Take the time to do it. And then look at your current lifestyle. What is it financially? Like, this is important, folks. I mean, if you really want to succeed in business, you've got to figure out the numbers. 
you got to figure out how much money you actually need to survive. And how much money you want is a different thing. Like, what do you need for survival? Especially leaving out of here. you got to know this number. Because this will set you apart from those that don't. Because a lot of you probably have people you owe money to when you get out of here. And you got to figure that out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not, listen, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a big, it's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. Because that means you got to hustle. You know, so work the numbers out. Work the numbers out. And then from there, ask yourself, what, what is it right now that you want? And what can you do to get there? Just get creative with it. And you'll be all right. Right here. Y'all having fun so far? Y'all getting some good information? Yeah? Okay. I want to hear y'all tweeting, yo, demo sucks. Don't ever see it. <laughs> I'm a, it's on y'all. If this sucks, it's because of y'all. Y'all got to ask some questions. Go ahead, Reggie. Uh, my undergrad was in um, accounting, so I didn't go to my, I didn't take my... I didn't take my undergrad here. I took my undergrad at um, uh, d uh, just a four-year traditional university, and I got it in accounting. Okay. So I'm getting my master's in entertainment business right now, and I'm in month nine. And just like you said, like the numbers are starting to like get like give me anxiety, really, like because yes. I'm going into the field right, like, like with well, I'm coming from accounting where the check is always coming. I know when the check's coming yeah. into an unknown field, so it's just kind of like to keep from going. Like my homeboys in the hood too, just like you said. Yeah. Like I'm from Tallahassee, so to keep from quick things like the, the quick fixes. Like how do you like uh, deal with that anxiety and just kind of like stay focused on what you're trying to do and like not worry about the money. Look, man, anxiety, what's happening is this. It starts with worry. You start worrying in your head. I'm going to give you how it actually is transpiring through your body. These are all signals, so you guys can be cued in. When you start worrying about something, damn, am I going to have enough money? Am I going to be able to pay this? Am I going to be able to do that? Once that keeps going, it turns into fear. Yo, what if I can't do that? Yo, what if I can't get this job? And then that turns into from your body, you feel it as anxiety. So that's what you're feeling. It, listen, that's completely normal. Just breathe. Listen, man, you're going to be successful. You wouldn't be here if you weren't going to be successful. Think about it. There's a lot of empty seats here. Y'all here for a reason. So when that anxiety comes up, man, you got to trust yourself. You can, listen, worst case scenario, you could always go back to accounting. Think about it. You can still make a check. I mean, you're not, the, what, what you think is the worst case scenario is not the worst case scenario. You're not going to die. That is the worst case scenario. Everything else is child's play. Those are, those are, those are real concerns. Like, yo, what if I don't got enough money? Like, how am I going to do this? Yo, that's anxiety, man. I get it. But yo, trust yourself, man. You chose, when you came here, you said there is something here that is greater than where I'm at. That's what you focus on. And then you can find creative ways. Like, I knew a dude, he found a way to, um, what the heck was he doing? He, he, he made this little thing where he was selling them on campus. I don't know what, I can't remember what he was doing, but he, was, he made something at surplus him. He made like an extra 100 bucks a week or something off that, or 100 bucks every two weeks or something. But it was enough for him to eat and stuff with. And yo, you can get creative and come up with some things. I'm personally from the school that I'm just like, I'm just, I'm tunnel vision. So I, my perspective is a bit different. But don't put yourself in a box thinking like, yo, this shit's going to come. You're not going to die, B. Trust me. Push comes to shove, you're going to figure it out. And the more you stay on it, the faster it comes. See, it took me seven years to get to that. Seven years nonstop. But I was messing up a lot during that route. I didn't know about attitude. These are things I just figured out afterwards. Well, why is it that this worked? So y'all can do it. Trust me, you can do it. Mike for this gentleman. Hi, my name is Eli. I'm an RA student. You saw me earlier today at the conference. Um, what advice would you give to uh, people, or to artists and uh, engineers that's looking to be unique and deliver a fresh perspective to the industry while succeeding in this industry? Man, just be true to yourself. If you're an artist, how many artists are here? Oh, quick, great. Quite a few of you. Real artists, in my opinion, and I feel like I've worked with a good, good handful of them, the best ones are true no matter what to what their vision is. If you're an artist, see, our vision sometimes gets diluted by other people's opinion. Don't let that happen in art, man. 
focus on what is it that you want to put out to people. Some people will not get it. It will take years sometimes. It's funny, I met the dude that sang, um, is it Triff Shop? Um, is it dude? Not Macklemore, the, the dude that sings that song. Like the singer, is it Triff Shop? Yes. What's his name? Yeah. So I met him. We worked at a charity event, and Macklemore was there. And he was there, and he was singing the song. And, man, this dude's energy, I mean, he was just like, Oh, and I'm just like, man, what is it with this dude? Like, I see people like that, and I'm like, I want what he has. You know, like, he's just big chested, just big smile. I'm like, man, what is going on, man? Nice to meet you. I'm demo. Then we start talking. I'm just like, man, what? Why? You are extremely happy. He said, he said, young man, he said, you know what it took for me to get here? And he got real serious, and I was like, oh, shit. I was just thinking I was going to get like, yo, I, you know, I do push-ups in the morning. Like, that's what I, he just dropped. He said, young man, you know, what it, you know what it took for me to get here? I was like, no, sir. He said, I've been working at this for 35 years. He said, a year ago, I was singing on a bar, and there were five people, and they weren't even paying attention to me. You know how many times I went and I performed? And there was nobody there. You know how many times I went to create knowing that nobody was going to hear it? I was like, no. I was like, what, what, what kept you going? He said, it's my artistry. It's my heartbeat. I, I'm an artist. If I don't create, how can I ever, how can I live? I was like, man. He's like, young man, five people. He said, there's 18,000 people out there, and they're going to sing every note that I'm about to sing. And he was right, boy. <laughs> they were singing that junk. <laughs> I was singing it, you know? <laughs> Shout out to him. So it's, you know, it's another thing I'll tell you. I'll get I'll, right here next, next question. But this is something I'll tell you. And... Really let this sit in. Amateurs compete with other people. Professionals compete with themselves. You're, this is, this, people ask me all the time, like, yo, man, who you compete? I'm like, I'm in competition with myself. I'm not competing against anybody else. It's cool if people do it. Like, I don't know if y'all know Fabian. Mixer Fabian. Fabian was doing amazing. Same thing. He went to the hip factory. I don't know if he the best, but <laughs> I mean, come on, man. <laughs> he good, but no, no, no. He's Fabian's my homeboy, and I learned a lot from Fabian. But Fabian, he was in the same situation. Fabian, went, when I got there, was like an assistant for like a year, and then became doing all of Dark Child's record. He was doing major things, and I, I was just like, wow. I was just in awe of him. Now, there were other people there that were constantly trying to be like Fabian. I was just happy to learn from Fabian. I'll try to assist them anywhere I can, but that's him. You know, he did it in two years. It took me seven. It took, when's 35? Listen, it don't matter. Time is not even of, out of importance as long as you get there. If it takes you 20 years, it takes you five, it takes you three, it doesn't matter as long as you get there. You got to stay focused on the goal. It's in sight. And before you know it, this is the funny thing. When you're going through it, it seems like, man, this shit is the worst. And then you get to the position where I'm at, where you're like, man, that shit was a cakewalk. <laughs> oh, you're like, who are you kidding? <laughs> but that's what it feels like now because it's over. It's in the past. You don't think about it anymore. You just think about what you're doing now. Let me give you a mic down. What's going on, Demo? How are you? Uh, my name is Nick, and I'm an RA. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, you killing this motivational speaking <laughs> thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> right? Appreciate you. Um, second of all, it's not really a question. It's just more of a request. The other night, I was watching Fade to Black, and I saw you on there. I remember you was on there. 
Uh, you spoke here before, and you mm-hmm. told the story about dirt off your shoulder with the clipping. Yeah. That's one of the best stories I've ever heard in my entire life, no matter what. I'm going to request so, for that story. So like can you thing. either tell that story or tell another story from the Black Album, like your time on there? You know what? I'll give you another story. I'll give you all I know y'all want a story. I had a couple. Y'all going to make me run late. Shit. <laughs> and I'll give y'all one. This is what I mean when no matter how prepared you are. Now, let's go back. We're going back to 2002 here. So think about it. 2002. I've been a year in. And I've already worked with some people. I worked with the Cranberries. I started working with Missy, I Ja Rule. I had a bunch of things already at that point that I had done. So I, was, I had a lot of confidence, we'll just say. And, man, there was a point there early in my career where I, could, I had the Midas touch. Everybody would rave about how great I was. Like, they would go up to the studio, man, I mean, this kid is amazing. He, he just read our mind. He had our food on time. I mean, this kid is great. This went on for literally like a year. And then I met Missy, and I learned a lot. Well, that's another story, another time. And she introduced me to Timbaland. Now, I got into the game to work with Timbaland. Like, this is why I wanted to do it with him and Missy. I mean, him and Missy, was that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with them. They were the essence of what I got to, why I got to where I was getting at. And just like the universe works in your favor, I finally get the call. Yo, you going to work with Tim and Missy. I mean, with Tim and, and Jimmy Douglas because his, engi- his assistant had something else. So you're the next man up. I was like, yo, I did it. I just in my head, I was like, I did it. I got, I got, I'm going to get the opportunity to work with Timbaland. Like, this is it. This is the catch, though. There's always a catch. Tim and Jimmy worked in the only digital room that had a Sony Oxford at the Hit Factory. That room was always booked, so no one ever got time to go in there. And when things were empty, that was the room everybody went to. So it was extremely difficult. I had spent no time in there because that room was constantly, had people in it. It was constantly being serviced. It was just impossible. And then you needed somebody to walk you through it. Not like going into an SSL room or an analog room where you can figure it out. Like, if you did something, they were going to scream at you. So that room was kind of off limits. But I didn't care. I was like, man, that's, that's cake. I got that. So Javier, who's T-Pain's engineer, was the assistant. And Javier came over. He said, okay, look, this, I'm going to give you a quick run through. This is the mode Jimmy works, and this is how it goes, and lock it in. This is how it's going to be. I said, oh, yeah, this cake. No problem. It's basic. Session comes. About an hour later, Jimmy walks in. This is my first meeting with Jimmy. Jimmy walks in, like straight to the console. And I'm sitting there, hey, Jimmy, how are you? He's like, whoa, 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 what do we got going on here? Well, Jimmy, I got the, oh, no, no, this is all wrong. And he starts hitting buttons. And I mean, he's hitting every button. You see how fast I'm going? Like, he started doing this, and then two arms came from here, and then two <laughs> more came from here. I think his foot touched some. Yo, I had a pad because I knew he was going to do it. So I was sitting there, and it got to a point where I froze, and I remember looking at it. He said, Oh, yeah, this is good. And he walked out. And I looked at it. I said, what just happened? <laughs> and I got panicked. I panicked. I mean, I froze. I said, oh, my God, what did this guy do? I can't get Javier in here. I'm like, okay, we'll figure it out. Half an hour later, session starts. Songwriter, we're doing, uh, we're working on Brandy's Aphrodisiac album. If y'all, I don't know if y'all heard that record. So that's, this, this is my first record I do with Timbaland. The booths over there, it's the same room from Fade to Black, if y'all saw it. It's the same console. So the console's here, and then the booth's that way. So Jimmy's sitting there, and he's working the headphone mix here. That console was, a, was really, it was a great for dual engineers, because you could literally mirror each other. So I have my page on the same page Jimmy has, and I'm watching. But the songwriter starts saying these comments that are just not registering right. She's like, oh, this, I can't hear the reverb or the delay. But I'm hearing the reverb. So I somehow figured out that he put it in some split format where what he thought he was controlling, it wasn't that. It was on another page. So what do I do? Genius. I snap it to that page, and I start mirroring him, doing everything he's doing. Seems like common sense, right? Yo, the moment I start doing that, it's just like it's snowballed. He catches me. 
yo, what are you doing? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Start snapping at me. At that moment, like, he starts snapping at me, and things started, like, breaking. <laughs> he just, like, the, the speaker popped, and then the, 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 something happened with the headphone mix. It's like, listen, I don't remember nothing except beep. And I'm just seeing all this stuff happen, and it happened so fast, man. I mean, everything was going so fast, and I'm like, I'm losing control here. I don't know what's going on. Yo, Jimmy called my boss, who had never anything about me, 43 times from 10 o'clock till 6.30 in the morning, telling him how stupid, ridiculous, this guy's an idiot. Like, what are you doing with this guy? I mean, all sorts. It got to the point he would walk out of the room to call. I would call the receptionist and be like, don't put him to the voicemail. And she'd be like, he's right in front of me. <laughs> Man, I got whooped. I mean, I was certain it was over. I mean, it was that bad. I was just like, my, my career's over. Like, they're going to fire me. There's no doubt I am not bouncing back from this. I didn't even go home. I stayed there. And at 7.30, the studio manager came in. I walked in. And I, like a tail, like a dog being with us. He looked up. And he's like, what, what, what happened? I'm like, man, I don't know. He came in and he turned into Dr. Octopus. He started hitting all the buttons. Man, I don't know. He's like, but yo, you couldn't figure out the headphones? I was like, man, I know. He said, well, as you can imagine, they want you off the session. I was like, I know. And he said, but, I said, but? He said, all the studios are packed and all the assistants are on double duty. We couldn't put nobody in there if we wanted to. So you're going to have to get, stay out of his way. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I walk out of that office. I remember I walked out. I said, oh, snap. I got another shot at this. I was like, okay, okay. Well, let's get it together. Man, I went into that maintenance room. I pulled out that manual. That was at like 9 o'clock. By 1030, I knew that console better than the designers. By 11 o'clock, I was into the automation teaching the dude that was a pro on that how to do it. He was like, Wow. I didn't know you could do that. I was like, yeah, you check this out. Psh. What y'all think happened when Jimmy showed up? That dude walked in, didn't even look at me. So I was like, I already expected that. So I stood off in the corner like this. Timbaland setups right here. I'm in the corner, I guess, like this. Just watch. And then, sure enough, something would go wrong. I'd jump out because I knew the answer. No, no, no. He would walk out, go to the Studio A where Javier was working on Alejandro Sanz's Unplug album, go in with everybody there, like, Javier, I need you. My assistant's an idiot. Walk in, pull Javier in. Javier's looking at me like, yo. <laughs> I'm like, man, what's wrong? Da, da, da. I'm like, wow. He did this all day long. So I got to a point where it just like, okay, force negates force. This is not going to work. Obviously, he thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> This isn't going to work. So I just retreated. I retreated back, and I just said, man, I'm just going to watch. And just, I'm just going to stay out of their way. Hopefully something comes. And, man, I watched. And then a couple days went by, and I was just like, man, what's it going to be? They forgot. They actually forgot I was in the room. I started wearing the same color fa colors as the fabric and shit. I was like Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was low-key. They, they forgot. They started getting into personal stuff, so I said, I know they forgot about me. So I'm like, oh, okay hiding behind the speaker and stuff. And man, just like that, just sitting there watching, it just dawned on me. You see, I started catching a pattern. The pattern was they would go and they would record intro, verse, hook, second verse, and then everybody would break for 45 minutes. And Jimmy would fly the hook. But see, Jimmy was still treating Pro Tools like a tape machine. He was writing it in slip mode. No one ever taught him about grid mode. No one ever taught him about having something on beat. I'm sitting there going like, wow. Man, I got him. I was just like, I got him. Now, how am I going to be? Because there's no way I was going to just run circles at that point. I was like, man, how am I going to get that opportunity? So I just waited. So the sessions kept getting longer and longer. And like a couple days later, Static, Static Major. Y'all know Static Major? He wrote a lot of pop. Yeah, that was a great friend of mine. He passed away a couple years ago, but one of the most gifted songwriters I've ever, ever known in my life. Amazing human being. 
it was my first meeting with Static. And I was just like, wow, I get to meet Static. This dude wrote all my favorite Aaliyah records. He's just a, a beast. And Static walks in, and Tim and everybody say, yo, we're going to go to the, the club. There's a, there's a beat on that record. I can't remember the song, but I think it's track six. It sounds like a beat that Aaliyah would have done. That's the song I'm talking about. And they play it. Tim and everybody leaves to the club. And now the, the nights have been getting longer, and the sessions have started earlier, so Jimmy started getting tired. So he goes up, and I see him leave the room like all slick and goes up to this atrium, and I already know he's going to sleep. So what do I do? I sit in the lounge, and I see static in the booth, and then sure enough, I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, the little voice comes out of my head. It's like, yo, I know what you're thinking, but maybe this ain't the best idea. The other voice come out and say, listen, this is a great idea. We should definitely do this because we got nothing to lose. So I'm sitting there contemplating. I'm like, man, forget this shit. If I, I'm, what are they going to do? They already don't like me. What do I got to lose? So I just made up my mind. I said, if Static asks me, I'm, a, I'm jumping in that chair. Sure enough, I could tell because Static, he, he, he was like Jay-Z. He didn't write anything down. He would just sit there mumbling and he starts putting words together. So I started figuring, I'm like, okay, any minute now. Sure enough. I was sitting right here. Here's the booth. I'm in the lounge, sitting right there on the couch. He comes out. He says, can you? I said, yup. Went right in. Sat in the chair. We start going. Now, mind you, they had only worked with Jimmy. They had never worked with somebody that was skilled in this department. (laughs) So it usually took them four hours. It usually took them four hours to cut a song. Me and Static, within an hour and a half, have the song already laid out. Static's like, God, Lee, boy, you can fly on that thing. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, buddy. Now, this, this, is, this is when the universe is working for you. This is when it's working for you. Static sits there, and he tells me, he says, listen, we're going to change up the arrangement. The bridge is going to be the verse. The verse is going to be the hook. So he tells me, I'm making markers, setting the markers already. I'm like, oh, I got this stuff all set up. Yo, just like it was, I couldn't draw it up any better. We're on the last line, last take, sitting there like, here's the booth, recording. Here's the door. Here's Timbaland's set up, the couch. He finishes, right when he's about to finish the last line, everybody comes back from the club. I could see them. And sure enough, I see Jimmy. He sits right there. Static finishes the line, walks in. And everybody's like, yo, can we hear the song? He's like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. And he starts telling me the arrangement he told me before. <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> this moment. Some of the best moments of my life, actually. So I sat there. It's because very few times in life are you really this prepared for something, right? I was ready. I was hungry, too, boy, I'll tell you. So he's telling me all this, and I start turning the computer with my foot over so they can really see what I'm about to do to their ass, right? <laughs> so I start turning the computer a little bit so they're just enough so they get the angle. Man, he said, all right, so hook, bridge, bridge, hook, da, 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 da. You got it? Boom, 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 boom. I hit the space bar. That joker plays. Everybody's like, I could, see, I'm just focusing forward. There's a TV. It's not on. So I could see they're all like this. Like, I can see all their faces. Like, I'm seeing them clearly right now. Man, I was sitting there. I was like, oh, yes. Oh, God. Yo, repeat this. As you can imagine, they they, they were so excited because Tim thought, man, I'm about to hear this song tomorrow. He got to hear the song. They went back to the club. Jimmy walked up to me. He's like, wow, you, you really know how to work that thing. I was like, yeah, Jimmy, you know, I know how to work the console now, too, man. I'm sorry about that. He's like, forget that, forget that. Teach me how to do that. I said, I said, said, well, teach me how you do that. (laughs) Folks, six months later, he gave me his job. Six months from that point, he literally gave me his job. He came in and said, I've been looking for someone that could take this load so I can go work on other things. Like, there have been plenty of people before me. But that's what, that's what I'm telling you about your goals. It's there. It's meant for you to have it. If you want it, there is nothing that's going to stop you from getting it. Man, I said that at 15 years old, I wanted to work with Tim and Missy. That took me about eight years to do it. But 
the guy who had that job gave it to me because that's what was supposed to happen. That's what's supposed to happen for y'all. It's the same thing. Man, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to close it up for y'all. But, you know, a couple years back, um, I've always, since I was a kid, always been fascinated with mountains. I've always been fascinated with the idea of just climbing mountains. I just find it to be just one of those things. And for, forever, I always thought about climbing these mountains. I said a year and a half ago, I said, you know what, man, I'm going to start, I'm going to climb me a damn mountain. I've been thinking about this my whole life. I'm, I got to start practicing what I preach. I'm going to put it in. So I did the things I knew how to do. I went and found a dude and said, he knew what he, how to climb mountains. He said, all right, you need to start at 5,000. I said, shit, I need to go to 10, baby. I can't do five. Five's a little number. We need 10. He said, man, most people start at five. I said, well, I need to fast track it. I'm trying to get to Everest, you know. <laughs> Let's do 10. I'm cool with 10. He said, okay, well, look, we'll do this mountain, Mount Washington. Uh, in Washington State, it's called Mount Adam. It's about 12,000 feet. It, it'll be a good start for you. I said, okay, cool. So he gave me all the things to prepare. Now, during my preparations, I would go and I would climb smaller, like 2,000, 3,000 foot mountains. And I found the strangest thing. So, see, you would go early in the morning, and there used to be like 40-something people there that would do it all together. And it's unreal because all everybody would sit there, and everybody would be like, yeah, we're going to get to the top. Yeah, the top up there, yeah, we're all going to do that. And then everybody would start, and then they would go. The goal is to get to the top, and they would go. And then some weird would happen. Halfway up, people start turning around. Then you start saying, well, maybe they're not physically right to do it. But nah, there'd be people who were in better shape than I was. But they would turn around. They would be mumbling something or another of how they got to go or something or another. But they would turn around. I remember thinking, wow. And then more people would start climbing. I mean, we would keep climbing. We get about a third all the way up, and more people would turn around. That would just, I'm like, we're almost there. But this is the craziest thing I've noticed. See, right before you summit, when you're about 200, 300 feet, it's when that joker gets really steep. I mean, that's when it, it's the, it separates the, you know, the boys from the, from the, the boys from the real men, or the little girls and the women. And they would get to this point and they would just turn around like you can see it. Man, I went and I climbed that thing. And I, and it, I literally, a ledge, is, it's a little ledge like this big. And I sat up there like straddling. And I watched for like an hour. And people would just turn around and go back down. I, I kept thinking like the goal was so close. Yet when it got the hardest, they'd turn around. So I got to Mount Adam and I said, man, I'm going to do this. I saw that mountain. I said, man, I'm, I'm going to stand. I've been my entire life, I wanted to climb a damn mountain. I'm going to do this damn mountain. Ain't nothing going to stop me. Now, when you make a decision like that, you know, the universe likes to test you a little bit, you know. So I was under the impression that a third of the climb, a small portion of the climb was a glacier. I found out that the entire thing was a glacier except for a small portion. As you can see, that shook me a little bit, but I was there already. I said, man, you know what? I'm going to do it. I can't. I ain't messing around. I'm going to do it. So we start climbing. We start at 1 in the morning, right? Because you have to start early in the morning because if not, you wait too long, defrost, you can get caught in an avalanche. We start climbing. We're about an hour in. And my, my, I'm, I'm, I swear, my mind is just giving out. It's like, yo, we got to stop. This is dangerous. We can die. My body's like, man, we cool, we good, we just, just keep going. Like, <laughs> but my mind was looking for every reason to pull me back, to stop me. It got me about an hour in. And there's these things on glaciers called crevasses. They're literally like giant slits that are open that are like 150, 200 feet drop. So I'm standing on a ledge that's it's like this big right here, right? And I'm looking at a crevasse right here. And I'm like, wow, if you fall in that, man, you are screwed. It's, it's good night. And I'm just in awe of this thing. And I remember glancing over and seeing rocks here. But I just kept watching. And Brian, my, the, the guy that went with me, said, okay, now listen to me very clearly. We're going to short rope it from here because it's going to get steep. And just focus straight ahead. Definitely don't focus to the right. Of course, he didn't know anything about embedded commands and told me to focus to the right. What happens if someone says you not to do something? 
you know, I look over, and it's a thousand foot drop. The, the rock was over where Tim was at. Was, that thing was a thousand foot drop. Yo, what you think happened? The little voice came out. We got to stop this. <laughs> this is preposterous. <laughs> we got a child. <laughs> we got people that depend on her. I mean, every, and I sat there and I listened. I was just like, but then he says something. He said, you know, we can't afford to do this. I remember that being in my head. We can't afford to do this. And then that other little voice jumped out. I said, man, we can't afford not to do this. We going to leave this goal on the table? This is the biggest goal you've ever had in your life. This is what you're going to do now? You're going to leave it right here? Man, I got in that middle. I started, man. Damn, fuck, man. So I was, oh, man, shit. Nah, I got to go. I got to do it. Just like anything, when you make the commitment, you're going to get tested. It's just the way it works. Because this is what separates those that succeed and those that don't. Man, I got to the end of that ledge. It was probably like that much. And it's, it's dark. You know, I got my little headlamp, so I could only see one step in front of me. Folks, I got halfway, and I started seeing the light in front of me. Like, that joker went straight vertical. Brian's like, okay, here we go. Starts whooping out the axe and climbing. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> but it, I just went. And people be like, man, what's it like when you got to that point? I said, man, at that point, all I was thinking was just one step, next step. You see, by the yard, it's hard, but inch by inch, it's a cinch. And I just kept going, and I kept looking, and the sun came out. I started seeing the sun come over. Man, that was one of the most amazing things I ever saw. I looked, I said, wow, I still got a long way to go. But I kept going, 21 steps a minute, just step by step. Once in a while, I check up. Okay, we're getting closer. I can see the ledge now. It's going. Keep moving. It kept going. Man, I kept going step by step. And it was long. It was eight hours plus of just going. And I wanted to quit the whole way there. But I knew I wanted to get to where I was going. And it was step by step. Man, step by step. And then before I knew it, I just stopped. And I looked up. Man, I looked up, I put my hand up, and I did it. I did it. I did it. I did it. Don't, don't listen to me. Don't ever give up. No matter what it may seem, no matter what you may think, no matter what you do, don't ever give up on your dreams. Man, because when you're on that top, you know, I kept hearing all those people say, that's impossible. You know what I found out that day? It's not that it's impossible. It's that I'm possible. Thank you. all <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.